Hello, thank you very much for joining us. We'll be starting the webinar very shortly in about two minutes. So please bear with us. We'll just let more teachers to join us. Many teachers are joining us now from different countries. We've got hello from Germany, Bulgaria, Russia, Switzerland, Poland. There was something Siedlce from Poland, my home country. <laughs> We'll be starting the webinar very shortly. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll be starting the webinar very shortly. We can see many teachers are joining us right now. Okay, I think we can start. So we can start, I just would like to start with some uh, housekeeping notes. So Greg's presentation will be for about uh, 35 minutes. And uh, after Greg's presentation, we'll have some time for uh, answering, in answering your questions. If you've got any questions, then please use the Q&A box. And for normal exchange uh, with uh, other teachers or, or with us, you can uh, use the chat box. And once the webinar ends, uh, there will be a survey uh, where um, you will be able to download your certificate of attendance. So please keep an eye on that. And we'll also be sending an email to you after this webinar, uh, sharing a recording of this webinar, of this session, and with some useful uh, resources for teaching grammar. So yes, I think we can start and let me introduce Greg. Uh, so Greg has been involved in ELT for about 30 years. He's worked as a teacher and teacher trainer in many different countries, including England, Italy, Egypt, Sweden, and New Zealand. And Greg is a co-author of some of our Cambridge materials, like the off-the-page book for teachers with practical practical ideas to enhance learning, and uh, also our general English course, Cambridge English Empower. Uh, Greg is based in uh, New Zealand, so it's evening where he's right now. So yes, yeah, so over to you, Greg. Thank you very much, Gabriella. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I've just been looking at the huge range of nationalities. That's fantastic. So um, I really appreciate you joining us and greetings from Auckland, where in fact it's seven o'clock in the evening at the moment. Um, and it's great to be able to speak to you all. So the seminar that we're doing today is getting grammar off the page. So let's have a look at um, what we'll be covering. <clears throat> 
So I'd like to look at teachers. First of all, I'd like to look at teachers' attitudes towards teaching grammar. And then we'll have a look at students' preferences about the way in which they learn grammar. Then I'd look to, like to look at some key ways that we teach grammar, looking at the literature associated with grammar teaching methodology. I'd also like to focus on the way that grammar is dealt with in course books. And then finally, I'd like to share some practical ideas with you, which will hopefully allow you to focus on grammar in a slightly different way. So let's start with this question. So what I've got here, there are four comments um, by teachers. They're not, they're not direct quotes, but they're the kind of things I've heard teachers say over the years in the staff room. And I'd, what I'd like you to do, typing, typing your answer into the chat, is which of these four comments is closest to your particular attitude towards teaching grammar? So number one, I don't feel I've taught anything unless I've presented a, a meaty piece of grammar. Number two, students don't need grammar, they need to learn to communicate. Number three, sure it's important, but you've got to mix things up with other stuff, skills, work, vocabulary. And number four, when it comes to grammar, I like to make sure I cover everything with students. Okay, so it looks like numbers three and four are the most popular options of, of these. Okay, so that it may not be an exact um, example of, of your attitude, but um, number three does suggest that you that grammar is important, but you can't just teach grammar on its own. So I think if we think about teachers' attitudes, we can look at them in terms of a continuum. So on the left-hand side, we've got those teachers who think that teaching grammar is a waste of time. And clearly they would probably prefer to be doing some kind of communicative activity perhaps and hoping that their learners will acquire language. Then at the other end, you would say that grammar is absolutely essential. So there are teachers who believe it's really important and that they feel that they're not meeting their students' needs if they're not, if they're not teaching grammar in, in some way. So what I'd like to move on to now a student's, um, sorry, there we go. Um, I was heading in the wrong direction. So what I'd like to look at are some student comments which represent how they feel about learning grammar. So I think it's difficult to think of all the students that you've, you've taught. So if you could think maybe of a learner group that you've taught in the last six months, obviously within that group, there will be different attitudes and, and preferences. But often groups form a kind of um, a group identity in terms of, of their preferences. So thinking of that group, which of these four comments or behaviours do you think is most representative of that group? So number one, oh no, not grammar again. Or number two, yes, it'd be useful to know how to use the present perfect correctly. Number three, but teacher, you've missed exercise five. It focuses on grammar. And number four, a silent look of terror. Okay, so one and two seem to be quite popular options. Occasional example of number four, but not quite as frequent. Okay, so again, we can look at learners' preferences um, on a continuum. And on the left hand side, we've got those who are frightened of grammar, or maybe those who are very, very bored by the idea of grammar. And then at the other end, you've got those who believe that grammar is really, really important. And they get very anxious and often a little bit upset if you skip a grammar exercise in the course book. So I've certainly had um, learners like that in the past, who if you jump a, a grammar activity, they will sort of say, but teacher, we didn't do that. Um, so there's a whole range of preferences. Now, a third idea I'd like to look at is grammar and course books. So I think that it's fair to say that most contemporary course books these days are underpinned by a grammar syllabus. So often course books will have 
vocabulary and pronunciation and skills, but often it's the grammar that is in fact driving the syllabus. So in a course book, you will move from some very simple grammar in the early units. And by the end of the course book, the grammar that you focus on is usually a little more complex and challenging. In the course book, grammar is usually contextualized in reading or listening texts. So in these texts, there are usually examples of the target grammar structure. And then typically there are exercises that focus on grammar in, a, in an explicit way. So they, they look at how the, the grammar point is made, the form, and they look at how it's used, the meaning. And then in course books also, grammar terminology is used. So for example, um, parts of speech, noun, verb, auxiliary verb, adjective are used and also tense names like present perfect, past continuous, future simple, that kind of thing. So typically course books will use that grammar terminology. So let's now bring these three ideas together where you've got teacher attitudes, you've got student preferences, and then you've got the course book. And this is what comes together when we are in the classroom teaching a lesson. Now, ideally, what, would, what will happen is you will arrive at that very sweet spot in the middle of the diagram where all three converge um, and everyone's happy. But the reality is that that is often not the case. So teacher attitudes in the course book will be different or student preferences and the teacher attitudes will be different. So what this means is when, when the three don't converge, it means that we have got some conflicting agendas. So how do we manage those? So I think the first thing to acknowledge really is the fact that it is difficult to ignore grammar altogether. Why? I think because as we've seen, I think many students do want to study grammar, um, if not all the time, at least some of the time. Another consideration is the fact that your institution may require you to teach grammar. So there could be tests at the end of a course, competence tests, and um, students need to pass those tests in that institution in order to pass to the next level. Now, if you're not dealing with grammar and grammar is part of the test, well, I guess you're kind of in a way disadvantaging those students. The other consideration is that obviously, as we've noted that um, course books are driven by a grammar syllabus. So if you ignore it altogether, the course book can become very, very difficult to use because maybe you're perhaps excluding about a third of the content of the course book. So that can make it a very difficult teaching resource to, to use. So I think my belief is that probably the, it's the onus and responsibility is on us to be flexible about the teaching of grammar. And I think that students' needs and their preferences are probably a little bit more important than our attitudes. But it is also worth remembering that we as teachers do have choices about how we deal with grammar, okay? So we may not completely agree um, with our students' preferences or by the way it's dealt with in the course book, but we can adapt and change things a little bit um, so that we're trying to kind of reach some useful compromise where everyone is reasonably happy. So let's step back now and look at the, the literature associated with teaching grammar, the methodology associated with teaching grammar. And I'd like to start with this quote from Jack Richards. He says that current approaches to grammar in language teaching today vary from those that can be referred to as grammar first, to those that can be characterized as grammar last, as well as a range of positions in between. So I will be looking more at the grammar first um, approach in a lot of the webinar. And right at the very end, I'd like to touch on briefly what he calls grammar last as a way of teaching grammar. So here we've got two key terms associated with the teaching of grammar. One or A is the deductive approach to teaching grammar and B is an inductive approach to teaching grammar. 
Now, number one and number two are definitions of these two terms. So what I'd like you to do is match the definition to the term and you can put your answers in the chat. So definition number one, examples of the grammar point are given to students and the rules are explained, written or spoken explanation. Number two, students are given input containing grammar examples and are encouraged to discover the rules for themselves. So I'll just pause a minute to give people time to type in their answers. Okay. So yeah, it looks like 50-50 you've got it right or uh, wrong. So these are the correct answers. So a deductive approach is where the rules are given, um, either by the teacher or perhaps um, with some grammar reference material. And an inductive approach is where the rules are discovered. So for example, students look at examples of a grammar structure and they try to work out the meaning and also maybe how it's formed. I have to say, I have always found this terminology slightly counterintuitive because deductive suggests that someone is deducing something. So it, it does give the idea of rules discovered, but in fact, the opposite is true. Deductive is rules given, inductive is rules discovered. So there are in fact variations in, in both approaches. So here are three example variations of in a deductive approach to teaching grammar. So the first one is the teacher can write up examples of the grammar point on the board and just go through and explain the rules of how it's formed and how it's used. Another possibility is that students read some kind of reference, a grammar reference material um, that gives examples and explain the rules. Now, example of this can be often in course books. Uh, there are grammar reference notes at the back of the course book. So the students might read something like that. And then the teacher does a kind of a backup explanation and checks the understanding. So the third possible way of doing this or variation is that students study some highlighted examples in the text and the teacher works through the text and explains how the grammar is being used in that particular context. So these are three example variations of a deductive approach. Here are three um, variations of an inductive approach to teaching grammar. So students notice examples of a grammar point in the text, and then they are told by the teacher perhaps to try and work out how they think it's being used. So this can be quite an open-ended activity. Another possibility is the teacher writes some examples of the grammar point on the board and then asks some concept questions that guide the students to an understanding of the use of the grammar point. So by concept questions, I mean, I mean if you're looking at something like the present perfect, uh, the concept questions might be, you know, did it happen in the past? Do we know exactly when in the past? So we're talking about general time or specific time. So those questions aim to guide students towards understanding how the present perfect is used. So that's what we mean by concept questions. Or a third variation is that students do a student-centered guided discovery task that focuses on the way the grammar point is used in a text and maybe also on the form. Course books these days often provide these kinds of um, student centered guided discovery tasks. And we'll look at an example of, of one of those in a minute. The other thing to consider is the fact that an inductive approach and a deductive approach can also work in tandem. So here are four steps, four stages from um, a grammar lesson. So in step one, students notice some grammar examples in a reading text. In step two, they complete a student-centered task that clarifies meaning and form, the kind of thing that you would find in a course book. In step three, the teacher does feedback on the task. She writes up some more examples and also explains how they're used. And then in step four, the teacher rechecks meaning and form and uses oral concept questions. 
So I would say that steps one, two, and four are more associated with an inductive approach, whereas step three is more associated with a deductive approach. So you can see here with our working in tandem. So there is a great, I mean, although there are these two terms, there is much flexibility in terms of how teachers actually deploy the, um, these different approaches in the classroom. So I'm just curious to know in your grammar lessons, which of the two approaches do you think you use a little bit more? I mean, possibly you use both, but is your approach more deductive or inductive? and why, and I've given six possible reasons, but you may have another one of your own. So I'm just curious to see what people prefer or what they do. So there's kind of a mix. It's almost 50-50 and a lot of people are saying that they use both in the classroom. Okay, <laughs> the answers are coming so quickly, it's difficult to read the reasons, but, um, but that's okay. There's, it looks like it's fairly balanced um, across the attendees in terms of different approaches, but a lot of you are saying that you um, prefer both or use both indeed, as do I, I think. Um, uh, probably I tend more, slightly more to inductive an inductive approach, but I certainly do use explanation um, at certain points in the lesson. So if we kind of drill down and look at um, typical course methodology, what happens is students will often read or they will listen to a text and that text contains examples of the target grammar. The target language is highlighted. So that could be a question of the students maybe underlining examples of a particular tense, but sometimes course books will actually put the target grammar in bold, so it's actually easy for students to identify. Students then complete tasks that present or, or clarify the meaning and the form. And then often students um, may practice pronunciation associated with the target grammar, I mean, there could be something like, I don't know, contractions or weak forms, which is a key part of that grammar when it's spoken. And um, you may drill your students in, in some um, example sentences. And then typically students will have some kind of practice, uh, both written and or spoken practice. And usually practice goes from fairly controlled practice to freer practice. So this is kind of, I think, fairly typical course book methodology uh, with grammar lessons. So if we think about that methodology, um, there are some good things about it, I think. Um, the first is that the grammar examples come from a context. So when I began teaching, you know, more than 30 years ago now, often course books just had sentence level examples of grammar. And that did make it very, very difficult sometimes to explain how that grammar was used in context. The, um, so the, the fact that we do now have examples in context is, is, is really useful. There's often a logical sequencing of activities. So things proceed in a very logical step-by-step -step way. The approach is often quite student-centered. So students can work on activities, maybe first of all on their own, and then they can check together in pairs or groups. So that has a good student-centered um, focus. And generally, I would say there's fairly good coverage of meaning and form of grammar. However, despite this, I think there are some, some drawbacks occasionally with the way uh, grammar is dealt with in course books. A key one for me is the fact that sometimes students' specific grammar needs are not fully addressed. The other one is I feel sometimes that the methodology, the kind of methodology that we're describing here, is what I would call very heads down. So this means that students spend a lot of their time with their head in the course book. They may do a quick check in pairs, but then they're, they're back to uh, working with the course book with their heads down. And this can get a little bit repetitive and boring and therefore is not so motivating for students. So what I'd like to focus on are some specific problems associated with those two issues that I've highlighted. 
And I'd like to look at some ideas and some activities that show how you can perhaps address those problems in a slightly different way. Now, in talking about these, I'm not saying this is the only way to do this, they're just my ideas. And they may not work entirely for your context, but they might trigger something that um, would be useful or something that you could do in terms of adapting your course book to maybe make your grammar lessons a little bit more motivating and um, interesting for learners. The other thing I should say is that the three ideas I'm going to share with you, the first two are very, very easy to do if you're still teaching online. And the third one is maybe possible to do online, is perhaps easy to do once you're back in the classroom. So the first one, this issue associated with meaning. So often in the uh, course book, there is an activity where they have to match an example of the target grammar to a definition of meaning of some kind, or maybe a could be a timeline perhaps. Students are often very, very good at doing this. Um, they're also often very good at guessing the answers to the kind of concept questions that we ask. I, I gave examples before with the present perfect. However, even though they managed to complete these two things successfully, I am sometimes not sure that they have really understood the meaning well. And I often feel that their, their understanding is, as I say here, a little bit tenuous and a little bit superficial. So this is the kind of activity I mean. So this task from Evolve aims to get it to get students thinking about the difference between how the simple present and the present continuous um, and how they're used. Now, this is a perfectly fine activity. Um, it works really well and it focuses very much on the this, these two core concepts of meaning, you know, usually or at the same time of speaking. So Students can do this kind of activity. They can often do it very well. And then as soon as they go to use either of these two tenses, they will not use them appropriately and make some kind of mistake. So this is my idea of how to try and address this um, problem with meaning in a little bit more depth. And what I call this is meaning call out. So students, first of all, would complete the kind of activity that I've just showed you. Then I ask them to write sentences or questions, um, and they use I for a sentence and you for a question, and they use their own personal information when they write these sentences down. Now, then I have these callouts, which you can see in number four, and I say each of these callouts about three or four times and give students time to write. Um, I don't get them to check in pairs at this stage. So if we look at the actual call out, so in, in number four, the first call out is write a sentence about a hobby you always do. So students should write an example using the present simple. Write a question about another person's activity now. Now that um, should uh, generate the present continuous. Write a sentence about food or drink now, again, the present continuous, and write a question about something a person does every day. Now, what I say are the call outs, but I do not use the grammar terminology at all. And then after about four or five examples, at that stage, get students to compare their examples and see if they're using the same grammar, see what different kind of information they're talking about. And that gives you an opportunity to go around and check and see what they're getting right and what they're getting wrong. And then you can do feedback at the end of that time and they can check some examples with you if they perhaps are not sure about them. So the aim here with the call outs is to focus on the meaning, to call out the meaning. So the idea is that students try to map the correct form onto the meaning that you provide. So rather than doing going the other way around of, of talking about the form and saying, okay, the present simple, the present continuous, it's reversing it slightly. And I, I think that this, should drill down a little bit more in terms of how well students can manage the meaning and give you a clearer idea of what their needs are. Okay, so the second issue in terms of students' needs is associated with form, with how they actually um, put together a bit of grammar. 
Now, students are often very good at learning rules. Um, so they can say, they can very quickly sort of say things like subject plus auxiliary B plus verb plus ING. So they can say that very quickly and very easily, but when they go to use that um, to create the present continuous, for example, uh, they often uh, make a mistake. They'll leave out the auxiliary verb or they'll not put the main verb in the ING form or something along those lines. So that, that is kind of one issue, that they know the rules, but they can't actually use them. Another issue I've found is often that, you know, I look at the form of a particular tense and I think it's fairly straightforward, it's fairly easy, but there's often something that is very perplexing that, that students um, don't understand. And, you know, it's often difficult for me to work out exactly what it is that is confusing them. A final issue is the fact that a lot of the activities associated with dealing with form when you're teaching grammar are fundamentally not very interesting. So, you know, often students have to study these grids which summarize the form, and that's really not a very interesting thing to do. So, <clears throat> my idea here is what I call student form questions. So here's a piece of, uh, from Think, um, an activity that, um, particularly the box on the right-hand side of the screen where it says rule. This is an activity which analyzes the form of the first conditional in contrast with the second conditional, which is the learning aim of this particular material. Um, on the right-hand side of the screen, what you see is the context. The text in this case is a questionnaire. I've just included two examples, but the, um, the complete text is obviously much longer. So the kind of rule activity, um, the form-based activity is what you can see in the box. Again, this is fine. It's, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with this material whatsoever. But often when students complete these activities, I'm not sure if they've really got to grips with form. So my suggestion here is to, first of all, to get students to complete the task in the book, then I would send them back to the text, the reading text, or maybe the listening audio script. And I would then get them to find more examples. Then I would put students into groups of three or four students. And I get them to think of questions that they want to ask me about the form of the grammar point. Um, they could also maybe think of examples to come up with and check whether they're correct or not. Now, sometimes students are not sure of kind of grammar terminology or what language to use. So as you can see in step four, I suggest some kind of question starters. And then in step five, there could be a little bit of grammar terminology that you could put on the board to actually help them create these questions because you don't want them to be worrying about the question. You want them to be focusing on the information that they don't know. And then allow students about 10 minutes and then they can ask you the questions. Now, during the feedback time, when they are asking you the questions, um, it is important that they listen to each other so they're not all asking the same question. The interesting thing is in step five, or sorry, in step six, when they're working together on their questions, students also get quite a lot of useful speaking practice, talking about language, and often, um, working together in a group of three or four, they can often answer each other's questions before they actually need to think of questions to ask you. Of course, one important thing to remember here is if you're going to let students ask you questions, you actually have to do your homework and make sure you've studied that grammar point and are able to answer their questions. So that's, that's just one thing to remember with this particular activity. And then the third idea I'd like to share with you is associated with practice and, and this idea of things being very heads down. So a lot of course book um, practice activity is actually written practice and it's controlled written practice. So it involves things like gap filling, sentence completion, choosing the correct form, etc. So if you've just done analysis of form and meaning, and then you move on to controlled written practice, that means a lot of heads down class time. Often towards the end of a lesson, there is a freer oral, um, oral practice activity, which is maybe a little bit more motivating, a little bit more lively, but often students aren't ready to do that activity. They still need some kind of controlled practice to help them out. So 
this is um, from Empower. So this is a typical controlled written practice activity. This activity is practicing the second conditional and students have to match the two clauses. So the conditional or if clause with the result clause um, in order to create a second conditional sentence. So one way to kind of liven this up a little bit is I would take those sentences and I cut them up and I give each student half a sentence and I ask them to memorize it. And then if you're in the classroom, I, I actually ask them to hand it back to me. Students then move around the classroom and say their half and they try to find the student with the other half of the sentence in order to create a second, a complete second conditional sentence. So when most students have found their partner, you can check and help those who aren't sure. And then at the end of the activity, each pair says their sentence. So the reason that I get students to memorize their half is if you don't, students will take the piece of paper with them and they will hold it up and move around the classroom and it just turns into a reading activity. Whereas if they're actually saying their half of the sentence, I mean, that's a little bit of controlled speaking practice, but it also means they have to listen to each other. And I always think that's a good thing. Obviously, this is a little bit more difficult if you're teaching online, but I think it would be possible to do this activity if you put sort of groups of maybe six or eight students in a breakout room and give each student, you could um, send each student their half of a sentence, uh, whatever the grammar point it is that you're looking at. So these are just three ideas in terms of getting grammar off the page. But here are kind of five key principles. If you're thinking about doing this, thinking about how can I enliven my um, grammar lessons and get them off the page a little bit. So if possible, if you can provide some kind of student-centered focus and try and get students working in pairs or small groups, or if you're back in the classroom doing mingle activities, I think it's often good to get students talking about grammar and at the same time they actually get speaking practice. It's nice if you can, to some degree, provide students with, a, with some control. So it's an opportunity to tap into their needs. So the, the meaning call out and the form questions um, did to some degree hand linguistic control back to learners and I think that will give you a clearer idea of what learners' needs are. I think it's good to have challenge, but always check that the challenge is manageable. Don't make it too hard. And if you can get students up and moving, obviously that's when you're back in the classroom if you're not teaching in a classroom at the moment. <clears throat> so I did say that um, I would talk about grammar last. So this is going back to the Jack Richards quote at the beginning of the uh, session. So what we mean by that is often what is called ta a task teach task approach to teaching grammar. So in course books, most uh, grammar lessons tend to end with an, a freer oral practice activity. So what I'm suggesting is that you do that activity first. Usually those activities are designed to use the target language so students do the activity, you listen to see if they are using the target grammar. If they are, you can just move on. You actually don't need to reteach the grammar if they can use it perfectly well. Um, so you can move on and maybe do something a little bit more interesting. In my experience, it's more often the case that they are not using the grammar um, for that activity. So that means you can actually give students some feedback on their language, on the language that they were producing. And then you can go back and use the activities in the course book to clarify form or meaning. And perhaps you could kind of target one more than, you know, the issue could be more to do with meaning than form or vice versa. So you might be able to pick and choose which grammar activities you focus on and then get students to redo the practice activity. It can be exactly the same one, or you might find another one which is very, very similar. And I think it helps when they're redoing the uh, activity to put them in a new pair of some kind, just to make it a little bit more interesting. So that's what we mean by grammar last. So you start with a communicative activity, see if they're able to produce that target grammar, 
If not, then you deal with it and get them to redo the activity later on. So to finish off, what we've looked at today is we've looked at these different attitudes um, and preferences of both teachers and learners when it comes to grammar. We've looked at the fact that grammar rules can be given and that's in an inductive approach or we can get students to discover them. But also as we explored, there are lots of variations. And in fact, you can mix and match these, these two approaches. There's quite a bit of flexibility. And that's what I meant when I said that we do have choices about grammar. So in terms of using course books, the methodology in course books, I think is mostly quite good. It's quite sound, but sometimes it can be a little bit heads down and that's not always the most motivating and interesting thing for students. So really we can use our creativity to intervene and think of ideas to try and get grammar off the page in order to motivate students and make their learning experience more pleasurable and hopefully more successful. So this is the reference uh, for the Jack Richards quote. It's from Key Issues in Language Teaching from 2015. And the three ideas that I shared with you are from a book that I worked on called Off the Page, which came out at the end of last year. And um, it doesn't deal only with grammar, it deals with vocabulary, listening, um, discourse, pronunciation, reading, writing, speaking. Um, but we've looked at three ideas from this associated with the teaching of grammar. So that's, we've come to an end of the webinar. So at this stage, I'm happy to answer whatever questions you may have. Thank you very much, Greg. That was very interesting. Interesting ideas for uh, teaching grammar. We've got some questions in our q a box. There is a question from Ben. What sort, what sort of teacher attitude would you recommend? Um, I, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> Insofar as um, our attitudes are our attitudes. Um, Ideally, I mean, I, I suppose I wouldn't recommend a teacher attitude, but it's, I, I think it's good if we can be flexible about grammar um, and try and respond as much as we possibly can to our students' preferences with each individual learner group. So I think probably, yeah, the be, yeah let's say the best attitude is a flexible one, if, if possible. My own particular attitude, I think um, the sentence number three, was I think that teaching grammar is important. Um, why do I believe that? Because as a second language learner, I like to know the grammar. So um, a lot of my attitude is kind of driven by my learning experience of, of learning second languages. But I do try to be flexible with students and try and um, you know, meet their preferences and needs as much as I can. Okay, thank you. And there is a question also from Reich. Um, just out of interest, but Craig just said a quote from Jack Richards. I've never heard that before, and I probably would have marked it wrong. Is this perfectly acceptable and equal to a quote by? Sorry, is it? Is this is perfectly it? acceptable and equal to a quote by? Um, if you go in the Q&A box, Craig. Uh, sorry, um, yeah maybe best to have a look at this question so we can find the best answer for you right i think it's more uh, of a, a, uh, sorry yeah quote so by why it's more of a comment i think yeah uh a quote by jack yes i think it is i think so um a quote by a quote from jack ridge um yeah i think i think it's okay um yeah <laughs> teachers <laughs> um and we've got a question, another question. What's the best way to systematize grammar within a communicative approach? It's, I, I think it's really hard to, um, in effect, I, I mean, the, you know, the grammar first suggests what is often called PPP, presentation, practice and production. Um, now that is going to appeal to some learners and some teachers. Um, then the other task teach task, the, the grammar last approach, 
is um, going to appeal to others. So again, I would, I, I think it's, you know, when you're talking about systematizing things, I always think that that can be a little bit tricky. Um, I think that things can get overly systematized. And I think as a teacher, it is good to be res as responsive and as flexible as you possibly can. So within a group, there are going to be learners who prefer grammar first, and there are going to be other learners who would probably prefer grammar last. So what this suggests to me is you've got to mix things up a little bit and try things in a slightly different way um, and try to be flexible. And, you know, each group, each learner group, I find changes. Um, and the course book is there as a support and a base. But what I'm really saying in this webinar is be flexible about it and feel free to adapt according to your learners' needs. Thank you, Craig. Um, we've got many questions. We might not be able to answer them all, so I will just speak a few more. Um, sure. There is a question from Ben. How can I get very weak student involved in the lesson? Yeah, that, I mean, that. if they're very weak, often I think it's, it's often quite a good idea to actually put students of a similar level of ability together in smaller groups or whatever. <laughs> so that they can work at their own um, steam, um, at their own learning rate, I should say. Um, and if they are not keeping up with the lesson, then obviously you're going to have to sort of compromise at some point and then perhaps give them some activities to do outside the classroom, kind of talk to them after the lesson and give them some kind of extra activities that are going to help them um, as homework or um, independent study of, of some kind. Um, in terms of getting them involved with say more communicative activities in the lesson, that's where I think it can often help students if they're working at a similar, similar level of ability. Because sometimes if you put a very strong student with a very weak student, the weaker student will feel intimidated and will just shut down um, because they feel that they can't cope. Whereas if, if they have, are working with a student who is at a not exactly the same, but very similar kind of level of ability on a grammar activity, that can be a little bit more reassuring from them. So that's, that's what I would suggest. Thank you. Is there a difference between teaching a grammar for speaking and teaching a grammar for writing? Not really, no. Um, there is in so far as the kind of practice activities that you would do. So obviously if you're teaching grammar for writing, the practice activities that you focus on are going to be more focused on writing um, and less on speaking. So probably you're not going to be doing a role play in order to practice a particular grammar point. What's often different is the type of grammar. Um, so there are some grammar points which are more prevalent in written language and other grammar points which are more prevalent in spoken language. So there could be a change in terms of content, but in terms of the kind of methodological ideas that I've talked about today, I think all of them are applicable, whether you're teaching, speaking or writing or some kind. Thank you. And one last question. Um, how can I make past simple easy for young learners? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I, how can you make it easy? I think the key thing is to try probably to try and focus on their experience and the kinds of things that they are interested in. I think for younger learners, there's probably quite a strong argument for a grammar last approach. So getting them to do some kind of fun communicative activity where um, they would ideally be using the past simple. And then obviously they may not be, and then kind of adding in those past forms and getting them to redo the activity again, as I suggested with a new, new partner or um, in a different kind of pair or group or whatever. So I think to try and make it more motivating for these younger learners. I think there is quite a strong argument there for adopting a grammar last approach and, and you know, 
if you go in and tell young learners, we're going to be doing grammar today, they'll probably go, oh, boring. Um, whereas if you sort of go in and say, okay, we're going to play this game about the past, um, they'll be more motivated by that and you can work from there. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all of your questions. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any more time to answer any more questions, um, but we hope you found the webinar useful. And just, just to let you know again that just when this webinar ends, uh, there will be a survey where you will be able to download your certificate of uh, attendance. And also in the next few days, we'll be sending an email to you with a recording of this webinar and some uh, useful resources. So please keep an eye um, on your inbox. Uh, so yes, you should have an email from us very soon. So yes, so thank you very much. That was very interesting, Greg. And thank you very much for all teachers for joining us today. And we'll be in touch soon. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you very Bye. much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.